everybody, welcome back to Brombird News. Guess what we're talking about on this episode? Today I want to talk about a hummingbird nectar, how to make it, how to store it, and then how to serve it. I make my own because I find it's the simplest thing to do. The proportion, the recipe actually, is uh, one part sugar and then four parts water. I don't make a big batch, uh, so this is the container that I use. It's uh, two cups of water, so for that I will need half a cup of sugar. So two things to remember. Uh, please refrain from using any kind of organic raw sugar or honey or maple syrup or anything else. Just plain white sugar is uh, wonderful. Uh, what about water? So some people have asked whether they need to boil water or not. You don't have to. I do because it kind of slows down the whole fermentation process. But all you need is just a tap water that's warm enough to dilute uh, the sugar. So I actually need to make another batch because I'm out. So I'm going to do it right now. This water is still too hot, so I am not going to serve this right away. I'm going to let it cool. Uh, to room temperature and whatever nectar I don't use right now I will put in the fridge because that will slow down the fermentation uh, process um, another thing that I've learned recently is that hummingbirds are not too crazy about really cold nectar. You see, they have to burn more energy to bring that nectar to their body temperature. So whenever you take your nectar out of the fridge, let it sit on the counter for a while until it reaches, you know, warmer temperature. And then uh, also last week I decided to run a, a post on Facebook to see how often people are changing hummingbird nectar because it's been so hot. And it looks like a lot of people have been changing it daily daily or every other day. So how do you know if your hummingbird nectar is still good or not? It's pretty simple. So you see, this is freshly made and when you look through it, this is all pretty clear. When this sits outside and it's hot outside, it starts forming these funky clouds inside and the whole thing will look really cloudy. Or even if you don't see anything cloudy inside, but you see bugs and ants floating inside your nectar, it's no longer any good bring your feeder in, uh, wash it and replace it with fresh nectar. Uh, if you want to extend the lifespan of your nectar, there's actually a product I would like to recommend. It's called Hummingbird Feeder Fresh Nectar Defender. We know the scientists who came up with this recipe and it's absolutely brilliant. You just add a little bit to your hummingbird nectar. It's totally safe. It's been approved by all the authorities and your nectar, depending on the temperature outside, will last much longer. Well, I guess that's about it. Um, send me your questions if I haven't covered everything about hummingbird nectar. Lucien Pouliot from Florida is looking for a bird safe paint to paint his metal bird baths. Hi Lucien. I'm by no means an expert on painting things. I did a wee bit of research on what paints are safe to use on a metal bird bath. It was a lot more difficult to find an answer than I thought. Now, I'm not sure if your particular metal bird bath is covered in rust, but some folks have coated their rusty bird bath with a primer called Fur Prime Rust Converter from a company called Fuse, F-U-Z-E. Apparently, it's resin-based and therefore not toxic. It's easy to use and dries to a matte dark gray finish in less than 30 minutes. It also doesn't need a top coat. If you're into spray painting, another alternative is to use non-toxic Krylon brand spray paints and then apply a clear coat spray as the final. According to the cage bird enthusiasts, who are understandably fussy about what paint they use on their metal bird cages, Rust-Oleum paint is apparently safe. To be absolutely certain though, I'd visit your local paint store and ask them what outdoor metal paints are non-toxic and applicable to something that's continually wet. Believe it or not, one can actually buy bird baths that rust on purpose based upon the premise that the oxidizing iron releases minerals that are beneficial to birds. I'm not aware of any studies to prove or disprove that, but I can tell you that drinking reddish brown rusty water will certainly not harm birds in any way. 
Knowing that there are roughly 11,000 bird species in the world, it would be fun to know just how many birds we have. I'd read years ago in an older edition of an ornithology textbook that there were about 200 billion worldwide. However, a scientific-based estimate done about 24 years ago put the number somewhere between 200 and 400 billion birds. But that was based upon outdated data collection and analytical methods. According to a recently published study based on 9,700 species, the real number is approximately closer to 50 billion birds. The research team working mostly out of the University of New South Wales in Australia used three pools of data to determine the overall count estimate. Specifically, data collected by Partners in Flight, which is a consortium of organizations studying bird migration worldwide, BirdLife International, the world's top bird conservation organization, and a new source of data originating from citizen science, basically volunteer citizens collecting information on wild birds. What was really interesting is that the researchers actually came up with the Billion Club, which consists of four members or species whose earthly numbers exceed one billion. They are the house sparrow at 1.6 billion, the Eurasian starling at 1.3, the ring-billed gull at 1.2, and the barn swallow at 1.1. I guess they forgot the lowly chicken at 26 billion. But here is the more important number. 1,180 species have fewer than 5,000 individuals. We need to work harder to reverse that number before we lose those species altogether. Earlier this year, I shared a story about a racing pigeon that's disappeared in the U.S. and then mysteriously ended up in Australia. Well, that story ended up being a fake, but last week's event in the U.K., uh, which is now dubbed the worst day in the pigeon racing history, is really true. So last week uh, in the U.K., a three-hour pigeon race, which had 9,000 pigeons, took place in Peterborough. But somehow, 5,000 of those pigeons never showed up at the finish line, and they haven't yet returned to their roost. They simply disappeared. So pigeon fanciers, scientists, researchers are trying to figure out what happened, but they still don't have an answer. One theory is that a solar event caused a disturbance in the Earth's magnetosphere, and this is what birds used to navigate, making birds completely disoriented and forcing them to fly off track. But that still remains a mystery. So now UK residents have been asked to keep an eye out for erratic pigeons with leg bands showing up all over the place and to provide shelter, water and food for them. Let them rest and recover because they will eventually recover return to their roosts. I've talked about murder hornets and the threat they pose as an invasive species, but they're not the only insect that can cause problems for birds. Yellow crazy ants have become rather dangerous for birds. Johnson et al., which is located literally in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific, is a very important landing spot for birds. You see, it's the only dry patch of land for about a million and a half square kilometers of water. So when migratory birds land there, they're really tired and they're ready for their rest. But somehow yellow ants had invaded the island and they spit acid into bird's eyes, blinding them, then swarming them and devouring them. Poor birds. Well, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has just announced that this island is finally free of those yellow ants. They have systematically destroyed ants' um, nests, they uh, baited them, and they even used sniffer dogs to make sure that there was not a single ant remaining. Of course, there is a chance that a random ant will hitch a ride on a migratory bird's back and will invade the island again. But at least this time, US Fish and Wildlife is monitoring the island very closely, and they'll be back on it to eradicate those ants in no time, if needed. You know, the theme for this photo contest was actually inspired by my eldest son when we were watching how he played with other friends and we realized that three really is a crowd. All right, let's check out the top five on this photo contest.
He is the third place, the second place, and the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. August actually has two photo contests. The first one is the Tyrant Flycatcher family. It's a tough one because there are only a few bird species in that family. So it's kingbirds, flycatchers, peewees, phoebes, and a kiskadee. Good luck, everyone. All right, everybody, time to say goodbye. Please let me know if you end up using Nectar Defender and what you think. And you know, our photo contest is not just for people who take pictures and upload them. It's for everyone to enjoy birds, to learn about birds. So come on over, leave your comments if you want to, or just look at all the beautiful pictures. Enjoy your week. I'll see you in two weeks.